I know you're a big fan of David Bowie and he didn't see Everyone's like, a fan of David Bowie, right? Right, right, yeah. David Bowie, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I enjoyed making the record. Uh, you know, I don't think I've ever made an album with a mission statement. You know, whenever I've come up with titles or ways of describing a record, um, it's it's come afterwards. You know, and I know very few artists that sort of say, we're going to aim to make this thing here. Because that's not how creativity works. You know, you have thousands of ideas all the time, like little ideas that explode. And as you go on, you see themes that develop. Like one idea leads to another, which leads to another. And gradually it takes form. Um, but no, uh, I, I wouldn't say it had a, a mission statement. If, if anything, um, I think that the aim of any artist is uh, to retain your identity. So in other words, so you're comfortable with who you are and, and don't want to change your identity, but still want to create something new. So to put it simply, so that somebody puts on the Franz Ferdinand record and goes within seconds, within like under two seconds goes, that's Franz Ferdinand, but oh, they're doing something I haven't heard before. I, I always had a problem with musical genre or, or the idea of having to strictly stick within genre, uh, mainly because my favorite moments in music, you couldn't really place in a genre or bent the rules of a genre or created a genre, you know. I, I hate, I always hated purists. Purists are a pain in the ass. You know, the, the ones that say, these are the rules and to do it properly, you've got to do it like this. Oh man, you know, they make it boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> That's right. But yeah. you get it all the place, like you get you get mod purists or rock and roll purists or techno purists or hip hop purists or whatever and just purist boring. Yeah. 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 The rock rock music is is absolutely rammed full of very boring purists. British rock and roll can be terrible for it, you know. Like, like uh, there's this idea that the the perfect British music was made sometime around about 1969, and uh, no, no, not not for me. I mean, I, I love so much in the history of British rock and roll and British rock music, um, but I don't want to because I love the Kinks. Doesn't mean I want to recreate the Kinks. You know, yeah. the Kinks create the Kinks. You know, you know, like, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, it's funny. Like I, I remember right back at the beginning when. We were still in Glasgow before we'd signed to a record label, mm -hmm. uh, and when you've got a new band that's buzzy and lots of suddenly like record label A and R guys, they they kind of like get excited and they start telling each other, "There's this yeah. band, we all want to sign them," and blah de blah. And so we spoke to lots of people, like lots of guys from labels kept on coming up, and and for the most part they'd say things like, "Oh, you guys are going to be the next." Coldplay, the next Stone Roses, the next whoever, you know, like, like just naming bands. And um, there were two people, Lawrence Bell and Tom Friend from uh, 369 Records. They were the only ones that said, uh, you're going to be the first Franz Ferdinand. And so... That's encouraging. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, like, yeah, of course, that's what you want to be. You want to be the first whoever. Not You don't want to yeah. be repeating what somebody else has oh, done. Sometimes I just get hit by the charisma of someone uh, or the charisma of a band and uh, there's a band from Australia at the moment um, called Amel and the Sniffers I don't know this band, but, uh, and in many ways they're a kind of like a down dirty really basic rock and roll band you know they're, they're not pushing any boundaries in terms of inventing a new sound but when you see somebody come on stage and they've just got that charisma and you think oh man here is a total star that feels really good, you know, I, 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 I love that. And Amy, the girl that, um, that sings for the band, she's like a cross between, I don't know, Iggy, she's got an Iggy vibe. It's like, if you imagine a cross between Iggy, a really dirty Bridget Bardot, <laughs> and maybe one of my mum's drunken friends from a 1970s <laughs> dinner party. Like, <laughs> uh, and so that's cool, you know, like, like, like it, it, it's, while being themselves as well, like, like they, they've got their own personality, so I like them. Um, 
There's a girl in London called Maggie Brown. Uh, I love her writing. It's it's really cool. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've been listening to. That's kind of uh, cutting edge. Jimmy Tenor, you know, I really love Jimmy Tenor. Oh, I know. Um, audiobooks. Have you heard audiobooks? No, I haven't heard audiobooks. Uh, it, it's a, do you know audiobooks? You know, uh, it's a it's a duo in London, electronic kind of thing, um, uh, with a producer called David Wrench, uh, who's a really striking guy. He's a Welsh guy, but he's albino, so he's got has the, the white hair and uh, but very long hair and this kind of uh, like a. I was gonna say a, a face that looks like it's from a different century, but it's more like from a different millennium. Like it's it's like he looks like a, a, a yeah, like a wise wizard or something like that. And this uh, uh, young and I don't know what the girl's called, but the girl that sings for them is astonishing. Like, like I saw them live in London just a couple of weeks ago, and it's the first time I saw them live in just a little place. But it's you know when you see something, you think oh. This is gonna, a lot of people are gonna hear about this. This is really special. Uh, and she was quite timid at first, but as she was getting going on, she was like losing herself and the performance was, uh, yeah, yeah, really stunning. So yeah, audiobooks, that's another one. Maybe. It, it's, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah like, I, I, I like having access to things, but it's misleading because you think that you have access to everything, but you don't really. You know, there's a really good record shop in London, not far from, from where I hang out, and uh, uh, the guy has a lot of soul and, and Afrobeat kind of stuff, and uh, uh, I was in there recently, and uh, I got a couple of Fela Kuti records and a couple of other African records, and I was like, oh, they're like, like actual African issues, and uh, I was like, oh, these records are great, and I, was, I, I, I sort of took them home, and then I looked them up on Spotify to see if they were on Spotify, and they weren't on Spotify. So, you know, like, there are some records that are, like, you, you presume that everything is there, but it's not. Like, like there are things that are missing. But I, I, I like how universal music is. You know, I, I don't think um, music should be the privilege of a few. You know, it should be enjoyed. I hate being, I hate having other people's taste in music inflicted on me unless they've got really good taste and I trust them. Yeah, you know, un, un, uninvited, uninvited playlists are yeah. like a, a, the scourge of the modern age uh, because I, I love music, but I, I, I like music in the way that I like, I like food. You know, I like to eat good food but not to gorge myself. Mm. I don't like to stuff my face with just any old crap that happens to be lying around. I like to find something that's good and quality and, and savor it and enjoy it and appreciate where it's come from and who made it. That, that's a good way to eat food, right? Yeah. Not to just kind of like go at the nearest place and go, oh, and stuff my face. Or even worse, like be sitting there and having people stuff food in your face without you asking for it. And so I hate it when you go to like, uh, I don't know, a cafe or a shop and I love going to a pub, not a bar, but a pub is a slight difference. A pub that has no music, no TV, no gambling machines and a carpet, yeah. which is a very British thing. Like, like it's in many ways, it's disgusting because it smells bad because all the spills end up on the carpet and stuff, you know. Um, but what's good about it is it absorbs the noise. So you don't hear the, like, you know, this room, it's, it's, it's got an echo, you hear the echo. Yeah. And I, I, I love, I think it's because I, 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 I'm exposed to sound all the time. Mm. And I, I, I guess because of that, I, I want to keep my exposure to sound as a special thing. And so I, I, I appreciate silence a lot more than maybe people who aren't exposed to sound. So I, I, I search out silence as much as I search out um, sound <laughs> and, and I do like like if I'm walking around in Glasgow or down in London or New York or whatever I often walk around with my earplugs in just to blot out the the excess of the city um, so that I can appreciate so when I want to listen to the sound I, I, I appreciate it I, I, I love it, um, it it's I, I feel there's a real warmth here in Chile um, and there's something about the music that we make and, and the energy of the music that we make and the personality of Chile as a nation. If a nation, of course a nation has a personality, it's a collective personality. They seem to work very well together. Um, 
Also, you, you know what it is I like about Chile? Chile, um, people are quite unguarded about their emotions. People are very open and, and they don't um, hide their emotion away. And so when you play a show, people are honest and giving with their emotions and that makes you, when you're on stage, it makes you want to be the same back. And yeah, it works for us. I, I, I love it. But, but no, of course, I, I, like the, I have some very special uh, memories of, of playing Chile. Some really, you know, like, like really, really special times. Like that first time we played in the stadium with, with you two. Um, then we played the festival at yeah, Viña yeah, del Mar. Yeah. That, we had no idea what that was going to be. We thought it was just like a regular rock festival. <laughs> With this, there's nothing else like that in the world, you know. Like yeah. that, that it, it's truly unique. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But that was that was fun, and I think through that, a lot of people in Chile got to know us. You know, like, like I think, and that's you know, I'm very thankful for that. It was, it was, but it was a great experience as well. I, I loved that, and um, but also um, the time we came. A few years ago, immediately after the the earthquake, that was really special. yeah, um, because I think we were the first concert or the first kind of public event yeah. immediately after the earthquake, and so we were kind of. I remember it happened. We were about to fly out, and so like, and so it, the insurance companies were really shaky about it, and the, the promoters were saying, "Oh, do you want to come over? Are you sure you want to come over?" And and management and labels saying, "Oh, are you, are you sure you want to go?" So well, we've kind of we've got to go. You know, we can't not go. But when we got here, I remember talking to each other saying, do you think anybody's going to come? Are people going to be cool to come out? And then, but they did. And it was this really, it felt, you know, really, really beautiful and very, very emotional. Very emotional. Um, yeah, so it, it was cool. So yeah, you know, I have, I have these great memories and um, tonight I think is going to be another.